Okay, good morning. I'm Alex Almanac. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Research Administration at Johns Hopkins University and the co-chair of the Federal Demonstration Partnership. On behalf, behalf of Michelle Masucci, Vice President for Research at Temple University, and my fellow co-chair and David Wright, the Executive Director of FDP, I welcome you to our fourth online meeting. As you know, FDP, you may know, um, FDP is an initiative of the Government University Industry Research Roundtable of the National Academies, known as GWIR. Our relationship with GWIR is one of the distinguishing features of FDP, because it means that our activities are connected to the academies um, in playing and connecting us to the broad discussion within government agencies, advocates for research, and our member institutions. I want to recognize Susan Sloan, the director of GWIR, for her tireless efforts in, on behalf of FDP and having served in the role of the GWIR director since 2008. It's hard to believe that this time last year we were preparing for our first ever virtual meeting and now it's become our new normal. I'm very happy that we have so many people that have continued to engage with us in this uh, virtual format and we look forward to reuniting in person when possible. Right now we're evaluating different approaches, opportunities or other um, scenarios that allow us to enable this format and, and build off it while continuing to work with um, you know, the, the hotels and, and venues to protect our health and well-being. In the meantime, I'd like to send a warm thank you to all the over 700 registrants that we have for this week's virtual meeting. This is the second meeting in phase seven. And as you know, our membership has grown significantly. We're now comprised of 217 members, and that includes research intensive emerging research institutions, um, sorry, research intensive emerging and minority serving institutions. And we partner with 10 federal agencies, in, including those agencies who will be providing an update later in our program today. We are grateful to the many individuals who helped to plan and organize this meeting and to the National Academies for their technical assistance and support. And I wanna give a very special thank you to Lillian Andrews, our program coordinator at National Academies. Sadly, this is her last meeting. She will, uh, because she will be leaving us to enter law school at Drexel University in the fall. I hope you'll all send her a virtual thank you for the extraordinary work that she has done on behalf of, um, for FDP during her tenure at the National Academies. We'll miss you. One of our most important goals for this phase is to increase the impact of the FDP uh, through broadening participation in, in the organization and working together to find new ways to improve the quality and efficiency of research and administration in our nation's research enterprise. And we began this process by launching an interest survey. And I wanna thank everybody who, who responded. This allowed us to learn about your interest in engaging in FDP committees and projects and for us to better understand your special talents and skills that you have that will connect us and enable us to further our mission. Jason Carter and Michael Kuziak are leading that effort and they'll be presenting some of those findings from the participant survey during the uh, faculty forum and business meeting, which is scheduled for tomorrow from 4.30 to six. We hope you'll join us and hear about some of our, their exciting initiatives and how you can get more involved. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to, to continue. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, I'm really happy that all of you could be with us here today. Uh, we want to remind you that there is still time to register for the meetings and that colleagues from your institutions are also welcome to join. So it's not too late to take a look at the program and see what might be of interest. Today's agenda includes our plenary presentation focused on addressing structural and systemic racism in the funding landscape. We welcome three guests to the Federal Demonstration Partnership for this session, including Dr. Marie Bernard, Acting NIH Chief for Scientific Workforce Diversity, who will provide an overview of the newly launched NIH Unite program, Dr. Byron Ford, Associate Dean of Preclerkship Medicine and Professor of Biomedical Sciences at UC Riverside, and Cheryl Townsell, President of Townsell Consulting LLC, they will help us to offer commentary and engage in a FY, uh, FDP-wide discussion on the issues that Dr. Bernard introduces. Our program will continue with our federal updates later on uh, from National Institutes for Health, NSF, EPA, NASA, ONR, and several other agencies. 
following the federal updates is an operationalizing and harmonizing open research policy session, which builds on the National Academy's roundtable on aligning incentives for open science. We are pleased to welcome a number of guests to the FDP for this session, including Greg Tannenbaum, Director of the Open Research Funders Group, Chris Borg, MIT Director of Libraries, Gita Swamy, Associate Vice President for Research at Duke University and Vice Dean for Scientific Integrity at Duke University School of Medicine, Jerry Sheehan, Deputy Director of the NIH uh, National Library of Medicine, and Mary Rose Franco, Executive Director of the Health Research Alliance. It should be a really interesting conversation, so I hope all of you will be there. We're going to conclude today's uh, meetings with the happy hour, which is open to all participants. We hope you will join us to have conversations about some of the areas that you are interested in learning more about and to connect with old friends and to plot our return to new normal, which we hope will happen uh, very soon. So please stay with us throughout the day and through the week to engage in the activities of the FDP and the important conversations that are happening all week long. Let me turn my attention to today's plenary session. We are going to be structuring our plenary as a roundtable discussion, again, as mentioned earlier, focused on addressing structural and systemic racism through a focus on the funding process. Our attention to this program is magnified by the growing body of work calling for an end to differential funding for black and brown scientists, and inspired by a number of programs that are happening at federal agencies to address the problems faced by scientists and getting funding uh, being published and moving through the scientific career pipeline. At the FDP, our primary mission is to ensure that scientists do science. And we all work, as you know, tirelessly to bring efficiency and quality to the collective effort of standing up awards and ensuring that our colleagues can do the work that they were trained to perform towards the advancement of science and the betterment of society. One of the most quintessential forms of administrative burden sadly occurs when faculty face inequity, inequality and barriers that are structurally and systemically occurring, whether intentional or otherwise, that prevent them from fully actualizing on their talents. NIH's new UNITE program was launched earlier this year to begin to address the issues faced within the agency in order to address these problems that are faced by black and brown scientists and by extension, other underrepresented groups. Our goal is to broaden awareness of UNITE for our member institutions and really to work collectively to come up for, with ideas of how the FTP can stay engaged in this issue and, and really carry it through to our home institutions. The panel will introduce and discuss the recent initiatives and then how we can all work together to make a more diverse, inclusive and effective research workforce across the US. It is really my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Marie Bernard, who um, is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging. Um, at the National Institutes of Health and the NIH's Acting Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. As the Acting Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity, she co-leads NIH's newly announced UNITE initiative to end structural racism. As NIA's senior geriatrician, she serves as the principal advisor to the NIA director assisting in the oversight of aging and dementia research. In addition to her duties as deputy, she has led a broad range of activities, including co-chairing two Department of Health and Human Services Healthy People 2020-2030 objectives, including the objectives of older adults and dementias, including Alzheimer's disease. She co-leads the Trans NIH Inclusion Governance Committee that ensures appropriate inclusion of individuals in clinical studies including by race and gender, race and ethnicity, and the inclusion of children and older adults. Prior to joining the NIH, she was professor and chairman of the Donald W. Reynolds Department of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine and associate chief of staff for geriatrics and extended care at the Oklahoma City Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Her national leadership in geriatrics research, teaching, and clinical practice has been recognized by the Clark Tippetts Award from the Academy for Gerontology and Higher Education in 2013, and the Donald P. Kent Award from the Gerontological Society of America in 2014. Her work within the NIH has been recognized with the NIH's director, the NIH Director's Awards in 2018 and 19, including the NIH Director's Award for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in 2020. 
Until 2018, she was the endowed professor and founding chairman of the Donald W. Reynolds Department of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine and the Associate Chief of Staff for the Geriatrics and Extended Care at the Oklahoma City Veterans Affair Medical Center. She held numerous national roles, including Chair of Clinical Medicine, Section of the Gerontological Society of America, Chair of the Department of Veteran Affairs National Research Advisory Committee, Board Member of the American Geriatric Society, President of the Association for Gerontology and Higher Ed, and President of the Association of Directors of Geriatric Academic Programs. Dr. Bernard has lectured and published widely in her area of research, which is nutrition and the function in older populations, as well as related to geriatric education. She was a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee that wrote the 2008 groundbreaking Retooling for an Aging America, Building the Healthcare Workforce. Alex. I'd like to introduce Dr. Byron Ford. He is the Associate Dean of Pre-Clerkship Medical Education and Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the University of California at Riverside School of Medicine. He was previously director of the graduate program in biomedical sciences at UCR. He received his bachelor's degree from Grambling State University and PhD from Meharry Medical College. He completed postdoctoral studies in neurobiology at Harvard Medical School and NIH. And he was professor and vice department chair of neurobiology at the Morehouse School of Medicine before moving to UCR in 2015. Dr. Ford's laboratory has studied mechanisms of neuroprotection and inflammatory mediators in ischemic stroke for over 20 years. He has been the recipient of NIH and DOD grants to investigate the neuroprotective roles of NRG1 in stroke, traumatic brain injury, cerebral, cerebral malaria, and as a countermeasure for nerve agent exposure. His work has yielded, has yielded nine full US patents and several additional patent applications. Dr. Ford was a member of the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke Advisory Council at NIH from 2012 through 2016, and has been directly involved in training of 10 postdoctoral fellows, 23 graduate medical students, and over 100 undergraduate students. In 2017, Dr. Ford received a grant from NIH Bridges, Bridges to Baccalaureate Program, which was established between UCR and Riverside City College to create a ed research education program to facilitate transfer of diverse RCC students into science, technology, engineering, and math majors. And Dr. Ford received a University of California Historically Black Colleges and Universities Initiative Grant in 2020 to improve diversity and strengthen UC graduate programs by investing in re relationships between UC faculty and three HBCUs, Morehouse College, Spelman College, the Morehouse School of Medicine and Fort Valley State University in Georgia. Dr. Ford is also co-PI of a $2.3 million Health Resources and, and Services Administration grant to expand and strengthen primary care workforce and improve um, health outcomes, particularly for patient populations facing health care disparities. Michelle? Thank you. Finally, we want to introduce Cheryl Townsell, President and CEO of Townsell Consulting LLC, an independent freelance consulting. Since 2004, her consulting practice has included program and project management, strategic planning, infrastructure assessment and development, capacity building, board and strategic planning, meeting facilitation, technical assistance for project design and implementation, and proposal and grant management services she is an accomplished senior level professional uh, with a diverse management consulting grant and proposal writing background and well-versed in national policy and advocacy, governance and trade association issues. Her healthcare career spans more than three decades and includes an extensive background in companies serving vulnerable populations, including federally qualified community health centers and managed care plans operating in commercial and public markets, including Medicare, Medicaid and dual eligibles. Ms. Townsell's managed care experience includes serving as founding board member, officer, and startup executive director for the National Association of Urban-Based Urban HMOs. The association is a national membership trade association of health plans serving government markets, primarily Medicaid, 
with a primary focus to provide research analysis and educational forums supporting the development of effective policy and best practice solutions for healthcare plans serving Medicaid and other vulnerable populations. Her leadership in policy and advocacy on behalf of vulnerable populations leads to her recognition in the form of a resolution from the Council of the District of Columbia in 2004. Cheryl's grant professional experience includes performance as an external grant reviewer for several fund, uh, federal government agencies and private foundations since 1995, including the Health Resources and Services Administration, Administration for Community Living, the US Department of Agriculture, and the Southern Reach Programs, AIDS United. Additionally, Ms. Townsell has served as an internal panel reviewer for private grants management companies and consulting companies, including Solux and McAllister and Quinn. Among her achievements in 2020, um, her internal panel reviewer services led to consultant uh, clients win of $2.3 uh, a $3.2 million and $1.2 million award from federal funding agencies. She earned her SM degree in health policy and management from Harvard University School of Public Health and a BA in psychology from Oberlin College. Um, so with those introductions, I hope you will all give a very warm FDP welcome to our panelists. And I'm delighted to be able to turn the program over to Dr. Bernard, who will walk us through the UNITE program. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, uh, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk with you today about the NIH UNITE initiative. Um, this is something that has come about as a result of quite a bit of deliberation. Um, it was very clear after the, um, uh, e the killing of George Floyd and all the COVID-19 pandemic with disproportionate deaths of uh, people of color, that uh, there's racial injustice in our country and that we have a responsibility to address this, all of us do. Uh, there were a series of intense meetings by institute and center directors uh, within NIH to identify initial issues, again, starting since last June, and consultation with others, a self-assembled group uh, called Acre Eight Concepts for Racial Equity, senior African-American and Black scientists, an internal anti-harassment steering committee, and lots of candid discussion about what are next steps, what should NIH do? And this led to a shared commitment that we need to address structural racism. Uh, there was a unanimous agreement that we couldn't let this tipping point pass. Some of the initial issues that were identified were that we need to ensure that biomedical research and the administrative system that supports it is devoid of hostility grounded in race, sex, and other federally protected characteristics. So in this new initiative, we're committed to delineating elements that may perpetuate structural racism in biomedical research, both within NIH and in the extramural community, the things that lead to lack of personnel inclusiveness equity and diversity. We believe that all ideas must be given an equal and fair review, regardless of who presents the idea, regardless of the dominant paradigm. And as mentioned, um, COVID-19 has made it painfully aware that health disparities and inequities continue to contribute to morbidity and mortality in our nation, making it essential to redress the fundamental causes of these inequities and to identify research programs that can provide effective interventions. So February 26, uh, we unveiled what we're calling UNITE. Um, it is representative of five interacting work streams one to understand stakeholder experiences, another to look at new research and health disparities and health equity, uh, I to look internally at the NIH culture and see uh, what things need to be changed within, if we're going to ask those outside of us to change, uh, T for looking at our being transparent uh, and accountable and communicating what we're doing, and E for looking at the extramural research ecosystem, and I'll elaborate a bit about each of those. The U committee is looking to perform a broad systematic evaluation of elements that perpetuate structural racism and lead to lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion within NIH and in the external scientific community. They led the development of a request for information that hopefully many of you had the opportunity to respond to. It was published that following Monday. Um, 
uh, after the unveiling the advisory committee to the director meeting. Uh, we've done some uh, solicitation internally to determine what the institutes and centers are doing. And we're in the process of getting started with qualitative data collection, listening sessions, and focus groups. The end committee is charged with addressing longstanding health disparities um, and issues related to minority health to advance health equity. Uh, and the goal is to ensure that we are transparent, accountable, and have sustainable resources in this space. Uh, this group presented on February 26th, a common fund concept uh, for uh, projects on innovations and transformation in health disparities and health equity research, uh, proposing two different FOAs uh, within a month, which I thought was a little um, aggressive. Uh, uh, given uh, timelines at NIH. They also committed to examining portfolios of NIH-wide stakeholders, developing an accurate analysis of our current investments in the space. Uh, as you may know, we account for our uh, research investments with a system called RCDC, Research Categorization and Disease Coding. It's usually based upon a computer-based algorithm that analyzes the abstract and specific aims to categorize a, a topic. But in spite of several attempts at doing so for health to pass, it failed. Um, and it's a manually curated category. So this committee is really interested in looking again at what's there, what might be overcounted, what might, might be undercounted, how can we make this system more efficient? And they also proposed at that February 26th meeting another common fund uh, uh, initiative on health equity that would be in, with fiscal year 23 funds. The I committee that's looking internally is charged with looking at our culture and structure to promote, to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're looking at data such as these. This top horizontal bar represents full time employee equivalents at NIH, some 18,000. If you count it, our contractors, our trainees, et cetera, that number would be more like 44,000. But on first cut from our uh, equity office, these are the data that we had. Uh, blue represents Hispanics, uh, green, non-Hispanic whites, yellow, blacks, or African-Americans, red, Asians, and gray, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and two or more races. Uh, however, when you look by job, job categorization, the distribution is very different. Uh, uh, scientific roles versus health and research roles, roles where you're supporting research like being a lab technician or nurse versus infrastructure roles, such as being a program analyst, a grants management person, an information technology specialist. And when you look at the very senior levels, uh, institute director, deputy director, executive officer, scientific director, clinical director, there's a lot of room for additional diversity and viewpoints. So this group is looking at establishing a campaign to make NIH staff aware of options for reporting things that may be perceived as racist actions, uh, expanding recruitment of senior scientists into the NIH intramural program, people who would be coming with tenure. Establishing, we uh, stated on February 26th that we wish to establish an anti-racism steering committee. Uh, modeled very much after our anti-harassment steering committee that was established a couple of years, I guess three years ago, uh, when there were uh, a lot of focus on uh, sexual harassment and other forms of harassment in science. And that we would work with uh, senior leadership to appoint uh, an individual to lead diversity, equity, and inclusion at every uh, institute and center to track, advance, and coordinate across NIH uh, diversity efforts. The E committee, which looks externally, and I do know how to spell unite, but it flows a little better if we talk about E before we talk about T, uh, is charged with performing a broad systematic evaluation of our extramural policies and processes uh, and to make recommendations for how things uh, might change or may need to change to foster greater equity. They're looking at data such as these. Um, this position that I'm in currently, the acting chief officer for scientific workforce diversity, or I'm acting in the role of chief officer for scientific workforce diversity, was established after the science article by uh, Donna Ginter, Raynard uh, Kington, and others uh, in 2011 that looked at success with R01 uh, grant uh, receipt by race ethnicity. Uh, on first look, 
Um, there were disparities for people who were African American and Black, Hispanic, Asian, uh, American Indian, um, and Alaskan Natives. However, when they controlled for all sorts of factors, um, English as a first language, where one trained, where one was working, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they found that um, the disparities in success with R01 receipt went away for all groups except for African Americans and Blacks, and that there was a persistent gap there. We call it the Ginter Gap. Um, this led to Francis Collins, the NIH director, turning to his advisory committee to ask for recommendations as to how best to approach this. And one of them was to establish this Coswood role. Dr. Hannah Valentine from Stanford University was the first Coswood. She came on board in 2014 and immediately started looking at data. And in 2013, um, the data with regards to applicants for R01 equivalent grants looked like this. Uh, Dr. Valentine did provide updated data to the NIH Advisory Committee in 2018. And as I stepped into this active role, we added in 2020 data and it shows a, a trend. It's a continuous, but slow, it's a slow, but continuous improvement. Uh, in 2013, uh, for African-Americans and Blacks, there were only 425 applicants. In 2020, it was up to 703. I'll point out that other groups are, you know, such as American, uh, Indian and Alaska Natives, you can barely see the bar here because the numbers are so small. Hispanic numbers are small. Uh, Asian numbers are somewhat better. And then when you look at success rates, um, the success rates have also improved from 12.2% in 2013 for African-American and Blacks to 23.6 in 2020, uh, although there is still a gap. And the numbers really are quite small. Um, and again, you finally are able to see American Indian and Alaska Natives, but the issue is uh, uh, representative uh, participation uh, by race, ethnicity, taking advantage of the variety of ways of looking at things um, that uh, promotes creativity and innovation in science. Uh, so this committee, the E-Committee, is looking at data such as these. Uh, one of their first recommendations is that we be transparent about who we are funding. Um, Sunshine is one of the best disinfectants. And they're looking at recommendations with regards to what needs to be done for career paths, institutional culture, NIH processes, and what more could be done in working with minority serving institutions. And then the T Committee, which is a great bookend to the U Committee. The U Committee is listening and understanding. The T Committee is communicating and being accountable. Um, uh, they uh, led the development of our uh, website. If you simply uh, Google NIH Unite, you'll find lots of information about this initiative. Or if you go to nih.gov slash ending structural racism, uh, they're looking at launching an internal awareness campaign, and they are actively working on diversifying portraiture around the National Institutes of Health. Uh, they tell us that by the end of this calendar year, when presumably many of us will be able to return to the physical workplace, if you were to walk around uh, the NIH the building where the NIH director's office is, uh, the clinical center, the largest uh, research hospital in the world, uh, what we call Building 31, where many of the institutes and centers have their administrative offices, um, you will see much greater diver diversity portrayed in the portraits there. So on February 26, we stated that we would publicly commit to identifying and correcting any NIH policies or practices that may have helped to perpetuate structural racism that we would continue to aggressively implement approaches to address the Ginter gap and enhance portfolio diversity, that we would launch a multi-phase tiered and integrated common fund initiative focused on transformative health disparities and health equities research, that we would ensure a robust NIH-wide commitment to a then in formulation National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities um, funding opportunity announcement on structural racism and discrimination and its impact on health, and that we would develop a sustainable process to systematically gather and make public the demographics of our internal and external workforce. We also committed uh, very uh, openly to things that we would do within NIH, such as implement policy changes that promote anti-racism and remove barriers to professional growth for staff from diverse backgrounds, including underrepresented groups. That we would appoint a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer in every institute and center. And I will tell you right now that you know, one can be uh, idealistic, 
what we have found since February 26 is the reality is that, that may not be feasible at every institute and center. And what's gonna happen instead is that every institute and center director will have as a performance uh, metric or expectation that they will track, advance and coordinate IC specific diversity, equity, inclusion activities and participate in NIH-wide diversity efforts. And then it will be up to the institute director whether they want to appoint a, an individual or whether they want to take advantage of already existing individuals or have a committee, it'll be up to them to meet that performance standard. Uh, we also said that we are going to expand uh, a very successful program within the NIH called the Distinguished Scholars Program that has led to much more diversity among uh, scientists who are in the tenure track uh, to include senior scientists to help enhance the diversity of tenured investigators. And Dr. Collins that day and that uh, following Monday when the website went up, the statement was posted, uh, Dr. Collins said that to those individuals in the biomedical research enterprise who've endured disadvantages due to structural racism, I am truly sorry. And I just committed to instituting new ways to support diversity, equity, and inclusion and identifying and dismantling any policies and practices at our own agency that may harm our workforce and our science. So what have we done since then? Uh, we published the request for information. Um, initially with the deadline of April 9th, we extended that through to April 23rd because we were hearing from several scientific uh, organizations that they wanted to have more time to give a thoughtful response and we received more than a thousand responses. So thank you to all of you who've responded. We're in the process of analyzing those data to help us to figure out how we should go forward. Uh, and as I said, we're starting listening sessions. The Common Fund initiative that was approved in concept on February 26, sure enough, March 26, two funding opportunity announcements were published. That's really fast for NIH. One very specifically looking at health disparities and health equity, another uh, looking at those topics at minority serving institutions with a commitment of up to $24 million. The total commitment was $60 million for this common fund uh, focus and the fiscal year 23 uh, funding opportunity announcement that will come out will presumably use the remaining 36 million. Um, the funding opportunity announcement that uh, with the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities was uh, working on was published March 23rd with 25 institutes and centers and offices committed up to $30.8 million. And the National Institute of General Medical Sciences on their own uh, put out a notice of special interest. And, and I think it's significant because they lead NIH in funding uh, training programs. Uh, and in this notice of special interest, they're soliciting applications to look at the impact of structural racism and discrimination on biomedical career progression. Uh, very excitingly, uh, we were watching this under development and everyone wants to see how this pans out. The NIH-wide Brain Initiative uh, published a funding opportunity announcement that for the first time is allowing uh, diversity to be part of the uh, scoring criteria. Um, as you who've been on review panels know, you usually review for significance, methodology, et cetera, et cetera, and give it a score and then, and is it diverse? Now, uh, with this funding opportunity announcement, um, the degree to which there is a solid plan to enhance diverse perspectives is part of consideration at every component of the scoring of the grant. Um, in terms of being transparent, um, our Office of External Research recently published for the first time data by race, ethnicity, and disability status. Uh, we previously had data by um, sex, gender, and career stage. Uh, and internally, just last Friday, our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion published uh, very specific data by race, ethnicity for those various uh, career uh, categories that I showed to you earlier. Uh, as well as by sex and gender. We established the Anti-Racism Steering Committee that we committed to. Uh, I was very impressed with this. We um, gave staff the opportunity to volunteer um, with just four days notice before the first meeting. They had to get supervisor approval to participate in the first meeting had 30, 391 people there. 
Uh, we now have 470 members. When you look at the demographics of the group, it's you know very representative of all categories. We have trainees, we have contractors. Uh, and the goal of this is to look systematically at policies and procedures at NIH that could lead to wrongs uh, and to addressing those. It's not meant to take the place of the EEO office. We have the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion for that purpose. So I'll close with this saying by Dr. Martin Luther King, um, because many people have said that they don't see themselves in this initiative, uh, but our view is that this focus on issues for uh, people who are identifiable, um, people from racial and ethnic groups, um, will uh, provide us lessons that can be applicable to other groups who are underrepresented. Um, the whole goal being to step back and look at what's happening systematically that may make things, um, uh, may, may lead to lack of equity for individuals. Um, our th thought being that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I'll close with this uh, graphic that shows you the 80 plus people who are involved with this initiative, um, people from every institute and center, uh, people from multiple um, uh, job categories, uh, uh, level of experience. I'm very honored to co-chair this initiative with Dr. Larry Tabak, the principal uh, NIH deputy director, and Dr. Alfred Johnson, the deputy director for management. And I will stop at that point and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Bernard, for that orientation. I want to just um, ask a couple of quick questions that are based directly on some of the information you provided from the audience. Um, and we have lots of comments coming in from the audience. Um, and then I'll turn it over um, to both Byron and Cheryl for some more uh, feedback. But one question was, um, is the Hispanic Latinx category broken out by persons directly from Spain versus persons from Latin America? Can you give a little perspective on how that category is being conceptualized? So in the data that I showed in terms of the NIH staff, it is not broken out in that fashion. Um, in the Ginter study that I'd mentioned, um, they did find that there were some differences based upon um, uh, whether one uh, came from, or where one came from, but it wasn't broken down and presented in sufficient detail for me to be able to say definitively um, one group versus another uh, was more successful in receiving NIH type grants. Um, thank you so much. Our Another question that came in kind of related to this, are the differences significant in the data in the R01 um, proposal submissions? Um, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. The R01 um, EQ proposal submissions from 2013 to 2020. I guess the question is, how is the data changing over time? Do we have enough data to be able to tell? We have at least three data points. Uh, I didn't show you the 2018 data, but at least three data points that show that this is a tr trend for improvement. Uh, so we're encouraged by that, but recognize we still have a lot of work to do because those numbers are so small. Uh, so we really need to work at every level to enhance um, uh, the pathways for underrepresented uh, scientists from underrepresented groups to be uh, fully engaged and funded by NIH. That's such a good point. Um, and last, just sort of technical question. How does the NIH plan to address the limitations of using census-based designations for race and ethnicity, and ethnicity, given that they're not global and universal and don't necessarily reflect how those categories are used in research? I think that's an interesting question because it kind of gets at the heart of how do we know what the magnitude of the problem is? We're not even defining the, the classification the same. I don't know, what are your thoughts on that issue? So you need to have Dr. Eliseo Perez-Stablis here, who's the director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, because he could wax on eloquently. You know, we know that race is simply a social construct and how we're going to actually measure that social construct is, is going to be variable depending upon what the research project is and how one uh, is trying to answer that uh, question. We at, you know, as was mentioned, I do co-chair this inclusion governance committee that tries to get an overall view of how we're doing and in including our race ethnicity. And it's been a continuous problem. Um, how do you define that? Uh, 
um, uh, we are stuck with a really large categorization that doesn't uh, provide the full rich richness of what groups are involved uh, in the studies uh, and the things that we track, but we strongly encourage scientists to provide the nuance sort of categorization that helps to properly answer their questions that we don't necessarily uh, capture in our reporting. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to, we have a lot of questions coming in. It's a very, very hot topic. So we're um, keep sending them in. And in the meantime, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Ford for some commentary. Well, thank you, Alex and, and Michelle. And uh, I was like, when, when uh, uh, Michelle first brought this up to me, I, I indicated to her that, that today I was actually in study section and, and it will be difficult to, to be a part of this panel. And in fact, I'm in study section right now, but my, my SRO was nice enough to allow me not to review any grants during this period because I, I found this to be extremely important and I really wanted to be a part of this conversation. And, and part of the reason that, that I was asked because I, I have a, a career trajectory that has been affected by many of the, the, the issues that Dr. Bernard brought up and affected in different ways based on different places where I spent my, my training or, or my, my faculty appointments. And, and, and it started as, as a PhD at Meharry Medical College, which is a, a historically black medical school where uh, my advisor was Dr. Jim Townsend, who's Cheryl Townsend's dad, who's an absolute, absolutely outstanding uh, uh, mentor and, and a research father to me. But, but one of the things that, that I learned from him and other faculty members is that it was difficult in that environment to get NIH grants. Many faculty members had been recruited from places where they'd done outstanding research, they received R01s and other types of funding, but the same research brought to Meharry was difficult to get funding. And it was primarily because of the, the study section members view of the, the research environment and the researcher at, once they became part of the faculty at, at a historically black college. And so that is something that, that I'm excited that the UNITE program is, is starting to, to address. And what I found is that it was a completely different situation when I moved from there and became a postdoc at Harvard Medical School where I saw, where I saw the reviews of faculty members and they were absolutely glowing and outstanding and, and it was sort of done even by by default without even saying much about it just that harvest great and, and in fact when when I submitted uh, uh, fellowship applications I saw the same sorts of uh, reviews oh this environment is great the PI is great and the the, the this student will will do quite well and and in fact when in submitting papers for publications I thought the the, the, the reviews were fair they they gave me uh, strengths and weaknesses based on the science I was able to make those changes, resubmit the papers, and, and then get the papers accepted into the journal. Um, along the way, uh, when uh, I was in my postdoctoral lab, my, my postdoc advisor, uh, Jerry Fishbach, became director of NINDS. So I moved with him to NIH, and I, I got a chance to see the intramural environment at NIH and realized that it was a, it was a completely different world. I thought that it was... There were lots of resources there, uh, as, as Dr. Bernard mentioned, the, the largest research uh, hospital in the world. But I realized that there was a severe lack of diversity of, of individuals and diversity of ideas in the intramural um, NIH system that, that also needed to be addressed in order to, uh, to alleviate some of, some of the issues that Dr. Bernard brought up in her presentation as well. And so, um, after my, my, my postdoc at, at NIH, my, my first faculty position at, um, in 2001 was at Morehouse School of Medicine, which is also a, a historically black college. And um, what I realized there is that, again, the review process changed. And, and there were many faculty members who were recruited from wonderful places, well-funded, and, and, and myself. We found it difficult sometimes to understand the, to put to, to reconcile what the reviewers were saying sometimes and the scores that we were receiving and and the and the funding levels that that were given and and and, and one of the things and and people may not realize how important it is but the difference between getting a one and a three or a four in your environment score 
can be a death nail in a, in a grant application. And, and despite the fact that your science is wonderful. And, and, and I thought for, for a while, perhaps I was being too sensitive, what, what was going on. And, and, I, and I spoke to people about this and I realized that it wasn't just me. It wasn't just folks uh, in my department, but this appeared to be a universal issue where uh, particularly faculty members at uh, HBCUs and already serving institutions were having problems getting grants because of the way that study sections perceive their, their environment. And fortunately, while I was there, I had the opportunity to serve on many study sections. And so I was able to be a part of that discussion where I saw the, the environment and the psychology of people who were making these decisions. And in many cases, well-meaning people, but in this group, which was not very diverse, they made decisions based on the environment that, that they were exposed to and did not have a clear understanding of the environments that, that some others, including myself, were going through. So one of the things I realized is representation matters. And, and when you have a diverse study section population, diverse in race, diverse in gender, diverse in ideas, you get a completely different conversation in the study section. And, and I was, I was fortunate enough to be invited to be a part of the NINDS Advisory Council. And, and that's where a lot of conversations were had. And one of the, the, the uh, moments that I remember is the a discussion of, of the Javits Award for NINDS and that the awardees were typically a very heterogeneous population. And there was a discussion to revisit how Javits Awards were or given and the, and we looked at the scoring matrix and realized uh, metrics and realized that there were issues with the scoring metrics that that disallowed other individuals from being included and so we, we addressed that there was a commission put together and there were changes made and after those changes made there was a huge increase in the gender diversity of the Javits awards and when the analysis was done what they realized is not only was there an increase in in diversity but there was actually an increase in the quality of the applications. And so that increasing diversity does not mean that there will be a decrease in the quality of applications if people approach this in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, an, appropriate, in an appropriate manner and, and in the right space. And again, representation matters. And, and I, one of the statements that, that would always sort of get under my skin when diversity came up is that people say that we can't find anybody, we can't find, uh, uh, diverse populations to go and bring into the faculty, into the faculty, or, or into the student body, and and the statement that I that I made and I continue to make is, you will never find apples standing in the middle of a cornfield, and so it takes work to go out and 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 make your population that was not diverse diverse. It will never happen passively. It's going to take active energy, like the Unite program, in order to make things happen. And so after spending uh, 15 years at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine, I moved to UC Riverside and, and I realized that I was again on the positive side where my environment is considered appealing to folks on study sections. And so it's, it's been a roller coaster, which should not be the case. There should be consistency in the evaluation of, of these items across the board. And I think that's an area where the UNITE is focused. And one of the areas that I'm particularly passionate about that Dr. Bernard discussed was, was Committee E, which is, is, is how, do we, how do we evolve the, the way that the extramural uh, ecosystem exists and, and how it goes about setting up its metrics for evaluating good science and being able to actively remove the bias. And so um, with that, I, I'm very excited to be a part of this panel. I think it is very important to me personally, and, and I think it's very important to, to the community, and, and I hope that my various uh, experiences can help to uh, contribute to the conversation. Thank you so much for sharing that information, Byron, and for your insights about how an individual's career can be affected, but also to help really illuminate that for our membership. I want to give Cheryl, you mentioned Cheryl's father, I want to give Cheryl an opportunity to also provide reaction and to encourage our, um, our webinar audience to continue to put um, questions in the chat. We are monitoring those and, and I want to give Cheryl an opportunity to give her comments and then we'll come back and, and address the many questions that are in the chat. Thank you, Cheryl. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Michelle. And I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of this panel. Um, just briefly kind of context before I kind of lead into my, my reaction or my comments. It's actually coming from kind of a, a three-part lens. One, as a healthcare professional with um, several decades of, of experience in programs and, and not-for-profit organizations that focus on serving vulnerable populations, of which, of course, Black and Brown is a part. As a grant professional with over two decades of experience serving as an external reviewer for several uh, federal grant programs and objective review committees, and I want to come back to objective review in a few minutes. But also, as, as Byron and Michelle both have mentioned, um, just just lifelong exposure to the issue, uh, to the concerns, or the you know of developing a a a, a fuller uh, workforce by including um, more of the underrepresented minorities, especially Black scientists. And my father is as passionate um, a neurophysiologist as he was, who absolutely loved science. Um, I would say that was only excelled by his passion for producing um, more Black scientists like Byron Ford. So um, I, I grew up kind of with, with this lens where he talked about um, not just research and not just the importance of including more Black scientists, but just also just his experience of NIH funding and, and his observations on how certain practices impacted the the funding of of black scientists. So those are those are just kind of like the three lens that I that I'm able to look through. So why does Unite matter? Why why does does this initiative matter? Um, the aims to establish an equitable and civil culture, and to reduce barriers to racial equity in biomedical workforce. I, I will say just as an aside, I really find that interesting that there's the goal to reduce because I, there may be kind of the assumption that, you know, to what extent will we be able to eliminate barriers instead of reducing barriers to equity in biomedical workforce this is really um, interesting. But in terms of implications to the community, I would say from the grant professional community, um, I would say that, you know, Unite's work is important when you talk about building trust by maintaining the tenets of and the integrity of the objective review process. By definition, objective would mean that you know, you're not introducing bias, that you're following um, a, a standard of, of criteria when you're reviewing the applications that's consistent and that's transparent throughout. So that's one of the reasons why it really matters from the grant professional side. And I would say, um, while there's overlap among the five committees, perhaps in, in addressing this, Committee T, ensuring transparency and accountability with internal and external stakeholders, um, I would say is very important. Um, fairness and transparency. When, as, as, a, as a member of the Grant Professionals Association, GPA, you look at their code of ethics, members among others are to practice the profession with the highest sense of integrity, honesty and truthfulness to maintain and broaden public confidence. And I would say that similarly, you know, with the, the tenants of the UNITE um, initiative, transparency and accountability is really important when you look at the review and award process of grants. Um, there's a statement about the NIH review process. The policy is intended to promote a process whereby grant applications are submitted to the NIH are evaluated on the basis of a process that strives to be fair, equitable, timely, and free of bias. And as Byron mentioned, environment is one of the, the five kind of standard criteria for review. Environment was the issue that I heard my father talk about you know, in terms of how his grant applications were reviewed. And like Byron, he's had the, the different experience of when he was at an HBCU, Meharry Medical College, versus when he was doing his postdoc work at, at Harvard um, Med, uh, Med. So environment really, that, that, that really struck me as I considered it more, my father transitioned um, 
in 2020, shortly after um, Father's Day. And since then, I had given more consideration to his conversation about the environment factor because my father dedicated his life on, you know, building an, a research culture at an HBCU and build and supporting individual researchers like, like Byron through programs like SPINES that he had uh, co-developed at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Uh, SPINES, of course, is the summer program in neuroscience, excellence and success. So he was very committed to, you know, helping to develop the, the core skill sets, both, you know, the technical skill sets, but also I would say kind of the soft skills um, to, to build success. But it occurred to me, the more I thought about environment, I was wondering, you know, is this a two-parter? Yes, work on continuing to build the research culture within HBCUs, but is that, is that, to what extent is that criterion um, unevenly applied or is there some unexamined bias on the, the review committees when they review um, applications? So it, that was one of the things that, you know, I was wondering to what extent if there's, if the, if the application reveals an approach that is otherwise defensible or, or meritorious of award, is there a new model where the award, where the award it could look at, how do you consider, how do you review, how do you assess the worthiness of um, environment? That was something that, you know, we have discussed in a group that Michelle and, and Byron have participated in. We've had a dialogue on this since late last year and have included our comments, our observations in our response to the NIH um, Unite RFI on our things that need to be considered when you look at environment as review criteria. Um, particularly, uh, one of the things that I looked at, if environment is also is including or or looks at the resources such as you know the state of the art you know lab or research uh, facilities if you look at things like historical uh underfunding of hbcus uh, some may be aware that in march in maryland the governor signed legislation to settle a, a 15 year old 15 year old lawsuit federal lawsuit regarding the underfunding of the states for historically Black colleges and universities for over $500 million over a decade. If, if the HBCUs, again, due to structural racism, if they have been underfunded, to what extent then does that impact the, the resources that they bring to bear that can support um, science, uh, Black scientists in development? So that was one of the things. And then finally, the you know, why does this unite matter? It's the people that are served by scientific discovery. So when you look at the, for instance, this the NIH National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, the center recognizes that a diverse biomedical workforce is key to excellence um, in science and it fosters innovation and discovery, which Byron alluded to earlier, that improves the quality of research and increases the likelihood that research outcomes will benefit all of us. Um, the more inclusive the, the workforce is, the more expansive and diverse the perspectives, tools, resources, and approaches to the problems that impact the entire community. But then of course, um, in addition to the entire community, when you talk about disparities, the, the diverse resource uh, or the workforce will address, uh, help to address, better address uh, racial and ethnic uh, health disparities. So those are just briefly my comments. I'm, I'm really thankful to be a part of this um, discussion and this dialogue, which really needs to be had and um, hopefully contribute to my father's um, legacy in terms of you know, addressing these issues in, in health disparity and increasing underrepresented minorities in biological sciences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for those comments. And I imagine as a person who's deeply involved in the review of proposals, you really get a bird's eye view of just how this can come into effect for specific individuals. We're gonna to get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. 
Um, and so we're going to start. Um, I'm going to turn it to Alex to get started, and then we'll just kind of go back and forth. Um, and please do keep sending your questions. Um, we'll make sure that all of our speakers have an opportunity to see those um, and be able to respond um, over time as well. Alex. Thank you. I'm Dr. Bernard, and speaking of um, uh, workforce diversity, a question came in that asked for NIH, um, can you provide specific examples of how staff diversity is included in performance evaluations um, of NIH um, Institute directors and other senior leadership? Yes, thank you for that question. And I did not intend to imply that that is currently in place. That is something that is being developed as a part of the UNITE initiative. Um, we anticipate that beginning fiscal year 22, October 1 of 21, that that will be part of the performance standard for the Institute, Institute and Center Directors. Uh, we anticipate that there will be um, things that are specific to each Institute and Center, and then there will be some things that may be NIH-wide, uh, and that there will be coordination with the Scientific Workforce Diversity Office and with the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion um, to make sure that this is representative of needs across NIH. And then, yes, the Institute and Center Director will be held to that standard. So uh, please stay tuned. Uh, as we said, when we uh, unveiled this at the special meeting the advisory committee to the director uh, in February. This is a marathon, maybe even an ultra marathon, and we don't know what all the mile markers are going along the way, but we do know that every June and December at the advisory committee to the director meeting that we will be reporting back in what we've gotten done and what we envision doing. And, and I think that our path forward will become clearer over the course of time. Um, and reporting out on something like that is something that will likely occur at that December meeting. Dr. Bernard, I wanna follow up with another question um, that came in um, and that is related to, um, well, I'll just read the question as it was written because it's well put. In terms of helping NIH to bring some of these wonderful concepts out to university communities, is there going to be any guidance on steps that universities can take to support diversity efforts in science um, in our specific institutions? I think that's on everyone's mind in the audience. Um, and they, this particular um, person was pointing out that they've implemented RCR workshops, responsible conduct of research workshops to address and speak to diversity. Or is there more that we can be doing? And, and I think I'd pose it to you first, but others may want to respond as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah great question. And um, something that we would like to see a lot of. You know, right now, um, the things that are, uh, have been proposed are relatively limited. Um, it's, it's getting started on this uh, journey that we have. We will have more things that will be presented at the advisory committee to the director meeting on June 11th um, that are potentially things that the extramural community can take advantage of. But you shouldn't wait. You should do what you think needs to be done for your institution. Uh, and we're seeing lots of exciting things happening by the various institutes and centers within NIH and beyond NIH. I will point you, however, to the Bagley Institutional uh, Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Funding Opportunity Announcement that actually got released in December of 2020, just before the formal um, announcement of the United Initi Initiative. Uh, that is a, a funding opportunity announcement that comes again from the Common Fund uh, that is meant to help with enhancing the diversity of the extramural research community. It's modeled after that internal program I mentioned, the Distinguished Scholars Program, that has led to significant increase in the diversity of our tenure track program. What it basically is expecting is that outside institutions will recruit cohorts of underrepresented groups uh, as faculty and we'll provide them networking and mentoring and additional resources um, to help them to be successful in getting to tenure and to potentially change and enhance the environment at that institution. Uh, the first solicitation was released in December, first set of applications in March. There'll be another couple of rounds of that. Um, 
And hopefully, even if one is not successful in getting one of those grants, one will look at that, will learn from that, will initiate things at their home institution related to that. Um, hopefully, when you see the data about who's been funded and where they are, you know, what institutions they're funded from, that will be a motivator for people to take action. And uh, hopefully, there'll be other things that we NIH can do to help nudge the processes along and motivate people to do more in the area. Thank you. Um, there, there are a series of questions being asked about environment um, and the environment criterion. So um, uh, Dr. Ford, in your opinion, is the bias in the environment discussion with respect to proposal scores unique to HBCUs or is this something that extends to other types of institutions? I know in our working group, we've been talking about the fact that sometimes public institutions, perhaps minority serving institutions, emerging research institutions, what are your thoughts about how, how broad uh, that concern is? And, and perhaps even speaking a little bit about what the specific um, issues that are, are unique to HBCUs that we need to be aware of and really, and really dealing with in this space. Yeah, I, I don't think it's unique to uh, HBCUs. I think this is pretty broad. And in fact, uh, when I first started my faculty position at Morehouse School of Medicine, part of the reason was because NINDS had recently started a program called the SNRP programs, the Specialized Neuroscience Research Programs. And the goal of these programs was to increase the research infrastructure at minority serving institutions. And this included HBCUs. It also included uh, Hispanic serving institutions as well as uh, native um, schools with, with large native populations, including in uh, Hawaii and in Alaska. So this, was, a, this was, a, was across the board. And the goal was that perhaps a way to improve the environment score was to show ways in which the NIH supported the building of an infrastructure so that when the, the applicant wrote about their environment, there were some enhanced things that they could put in the application to improve the score. Uh, I think that is also perhaps in some ways cases in, in, in uh, public universities as well. In fact, we even see that in the, in the, H, in the UC system. Uh, UC uh, Riverside is, is one of the schools that is a, a rare uh, research, intensive, research intensive, but also minority serving institution. And compared to our other UC counterparts, uh, it is it's well known that, that UC Riverside is underfunded compared to our sister schools like UC Berkeley, uh, UCLA, and, and such. So there, there are a number of ways in which this environment uh, argument can be to, to the de detriment of certain schools. But, but in, in thinking of, in, of environment, there are what I've listed four different components that could cause issues with environment. And one is, as we've discussed, bias. And so clearly there is some bias in reviewers against schools that are HBCUs and minority serving institutions and that will go into their scores. But one of the other issues is sometimes the people in study section don't know who your school is. They're not, they're not aware of what, who the school is. And so they don't know what to score. So they're not gonna give a one, but they may give a two or three or four say, oh, okay, it seems like it's a pretty good school. But again, that's lack of representation. That, that the reason that folks don't know who your school is because perhaps the study section is a little bit too homogeneous. Uh, the other issue is they don't know who you are. And so I think one of the things that NIH can improve on is having faculty members from HBCUs and minority serving institutions be more part of, of study sections, be more part of, of a lot of the panels. I've been involved in a lot of uh, diversity panels and, and not just diversity panels because the, all that work should not be placed on, on people of color, but, but the important uh, committees that are responsible for, for, for making change and making policy at NIH. And again, as I said, I, I was fortunate to be a part of the NIH Advisory Council. And I, and, I, and I hope and I do believe that my presence there gave a different perspective to a lot of the conversations that were being had uh, on council. And, and the other thing is that I've realized in, in study section and, and council is that predominantly uh, white institutions will sometimes get a pass 
or, or individuals will get a pass in study section. So that may be a, a, a wonderful uh, PI, it may have won a Nobel Prize and, and, and had another outstanding R01, but you can see that sometimes there are individuals who have a second or third R01, and you can, always, you can see that that R01 perhaps didn't produce very much. And, but that person will still get a pass because they're who they are, as opposed to the committee reviewing what they actually see on paper. And the same thing I've seen for, for training grants, that sometimes that, that there are training grants that will go to schools because of their reputation. And I know that I have in many cases had to say, hold on, that's not what I see on paper. This is not a good application. We need to sit down and, and re-review this. So I think uh, diversifying study sections and committees to make sure that there's people diversity. I think there also needs to be regional diversity so that people can know who other schools are and know who people are. And there also needs to be diversity in, in the types of schools represented in study sections. They can't all be from schools in the Northeast or in the San Francisco area. There has to be diversity in where people live and, and how they think in these study sections in order to change the environment scores. Well, Dr. Ford, I think we actually have several comments right along those lines that the study sections need to be more diverse, including the types of institutions. So I think everybody's there with you. One of the questions that came up, and, and I guess this would be for uh, Dr. Bernard, is has there been any movement on changing the facilities from being scored to just simply an acceptable or not acceptable? Um, thanks. Yes, um, there is an experiment ongoing right now um, to look at, quite honestly, a anonymized review. Um, it's for the uh, MIRA Awards from the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. And when um, the applicants are submitting, they understand it's a two-stage review. The first stage is to simply look at the science and to get it scored. And then at the second stage, to take into consideration the other factors that are traditionally considered for NIH review, because all of the points that are being made about potential bias in the review process, um, I think they're all very well taken. You know, I, in my academic role, I saw, you know, that um, certain groups, they call it the Matthew effect, that, uh, you know, this is a good school, you know, they'll do a great job. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, in the past, there have been attempts at uh, redacting to anonymize, but in many cases, the reviewers are able to guess who it's from anyhow, particularly if it's a very small field. So this experiment of totally, you know, when it's submitted, anything that might be identified, it's, it's they know it's gonna be just the science. So there will be nothing there that will allow them to identify it. And then the separate second stage, we'll see what uh, impact that has. Um, uh, and again, just that retrospective where they had done the redacting, I think that um, Dr. Noni Burns' uh, team, Dr. Burns is the head of the Center for Scientific Review, is hoping to get that published soon as presented in her blog uh, and in various open settings. Um, they found that the redaction um, uh, did not necessarily help underrepresented groups to get better scores, but the, that groups that are very well represented got worse scores. You know, so that speaking again to uh, perhaps uh, that Matthew effect that uh, that Dr. Ford very uh, uh, graphically described. Thank you so much, and and Dr. Bernard, someone is asking if you have a reference for the Matthew effect. Um, uh, we'll, we'll try to connect this person with, with that reference. Um, I want to make sure we come back around to an issue that I think Cheryl was talking about before, and that's this issue of having a diverse scientific workforce is critical to being able to solve the needs of a complex society. And, you know, we can't help but really understand that some of the lack of success or lack of ability to pursue a career to its full fruition um, through getting funding to really make sure that people keep their jobs and are able to be productive in their careers is connected and intertwined with the actual needs of minority communities to have better science to improve their health. Um, a question coming in related to that is that one factor um, that's often overlooked is the difference in distribution of topics that Black scientists want to study and the fact that that might be related to what does and doesn't get funded. I wonder if you have some comments to make about that particular issue. 
Um, thank you. Thank you for the question, Michelle. Yeah. I actually have more direct experience with HRSA grants than with NIH. So what I can say is that in our small group discussion about um, environment as a criterion with um, the NIH grants, I would just kind of, I don't want, know if I wanna say by contrast, but with my experience with the HRSA grant review process, it's a very, transparent process from you know when the recruit the reviewers are recruited the guidance that they are given during the review process and what i can say about what happens during the panel review process is that throughout the process there's this guidance that we have to be um, internally consistent within the panels but also all of the reviewers have to be internally consistent in their review of each grant and and throughout the process, we, you know, I, I hear um, during this conversation, there's conversation about um, uh, um, and anonymizing the, the, um, the institution that applicants are coming from. When we were involved in the process in HRSA, they've always, and Byron has talked about, we, you only look at the paper, quote unquote paper, or the application. In HRSA reviews, we're told we cannot bring in any external factors when we do the review that each application has to stand on its own merit and whether or not they are responsive to the review criterion, you know, each application has to be responsive to the review criterion. I think transparency is one of the issues that has really kind of come up for me because in HRSA, we do have to be very, each reviewer has to be very transparent in how they're scoring on the individual review criterion. And we have to support that through our comments on strengths and weaknesses. So not only do we have to, we have to substantiate our score, whatever the score is that we give on a criterion, we have to substantiate that through the actual um, comments on strengths and weaknesses. And I would, I would point to that as something that should be considered when you talk about transparency, is that the reviewers have to be accountable for how they're reviewing and our review chairs are actually holding us to that accountability when we are scoring. Um, I don't know if that kind of gets at what you're talking about, but that's kind of my, my um, experience from at least the HRSA uh, process or review process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there are many other questions coming in about um, the environment, which we have talked about. Um, but I also want to get at a question that Amy Cool Shuckers asked, which is um, very broadly that diversity of institutional type on study sections is important um, for many of the reasons that we have discussed. Um, I wonder if there is more that can be done intentionally to ensure that um, all institutions that have um, valuable science to offer are uh, encouraged to apply and really think about the award, um, the awards available through NIH as, as relevant to their work. Because I could envision a self-selection process that happens where institutions don't necessarily um, stand up to do work um, because of this historical issue around the environment. I wonder if any of the panelists um, have thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it, it's an important issue. In, in fact, in training grants, which I've been a uh, part of quite a bit, that is actually one of the, the criteria in which they decide who to award uh, grants to. They wanna make sure that the, not only the, the, the individuals who are funded, but the populations who are served by those grants are able to have the access to the same resources as others. Um, and, and again, I think it goes back to, so if, if you have all people on a study section from the same area, they don't have an opportunity to, to know others. And so they tend to score grants higher in areas that they're familiar with and universities that they're familiar with, as opposed to uh, just giving, uh, and, and as I said, uh, giving a, a two or a three or a four in an environment score can kill a grant when a pay line is eight or 9%. So it makes, it makes a big difference. So the, there absolutely needs to be representation. There also needs to be representation 
based on the types of disorders that may be prevalent in those areas. And that's also related to the question that you asked earlier about the types of research that are being, that's being funded. Uh, there are a number of, particularly the, the historically black medical schools that I can speak to, a lot of the research is based on community-based participatory research. However, it is difficult to get funding from NIH to do that type of work. And typically it will come from agencies like HRSA in order to get that for primary care. But, but to, 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 to support that sort of research in an R01 format is very difficult. In fact, it was more recently that the, the National uh, Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities started giving out R01 grants. That was not the case when it first started. And so that is something that is ramping up and hopefully will be more so the case where it can support the type of types of research that's being performed at, at, at diverse institutions, particularly minority serving institutions. Thank you so much for that response. Um, Byron, there is another comment um, that I wanna read and get your reaction to, and then we can open it up to others. I love your statement that researchers who are from underrepresented minorities can't only be appointed to DEI initiatives. They need to be holistically included in all aspects of the research community and peer review process. Also, I think the NIH should adopt NSF approach in which the NSF requires that all applications discuss the impact of any previous NSF funding. Um, how, what do you think about, um, I'd, like, I'd really like to get your take on that comment um, and then open it up to both Cheryl and Maria as well to respond. Yeah, I've had a quite, a, quite a bit of conversation about that. In fact, that was part of a, a, a school of medicine, I mean, a, a, a school-wide uh, leadership meeting that we had recently. Because it's, it's with with the number, because there are so few minority faculty members and women and women faculty members at a lot of institutions, when there are committees that are set up to discuss and improve diversity, a lot of times because they don't have a lot to choose from, they pull us into these community. I mean, in, into these committees, and and the problem is that one, it's a lot of extra work. I think mean, two, it's, it's work that should not necessarily be done by the people that are being affected by the, those issues. And I think probably importantly, many of these committees are not given credit for in merits and promotion for faculty members towards tenure and, 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 and other sorts of awards. So um, I think at least UCR is very aware and introspective about this and, and, and I, as I say a lot, uh, sort of jokingly, not jokingly, that that many of us have uh, have had to endure the black tax of, of having to serve on these committees and, and not get rewarded for it. And it does take away from the things that we're supposed to do, such as our research, in order to, to continue to do the things that we need for promotions and uh, and and, uh, and and merits. So what I would say is that it sometimes it's important to be on these. Um, committees. I think like today, it's very important to, to be on this panel, but hopefully when, with the work that's being done by these committees and the panels, that other folks in the field who are part of the structure that exists need to be involved in sort of reorganizing and evolving the structure so that everybody has a fair opportunity. Thank you so much um, for that. It resonates with me for sure. I don't know, Dr. Bernard or Cheryl, do you, either of you have any comments about that same issue? I, I wonder, Dr. Bernard, how that, um, if that's something that's um, perceived by staff at NIH, does it work the same way as it does at institutions of higher learning? Um, yes, um, at NIH, it's important to have diversity of um, viewpoints and opinions on search committees uh, and other sorts of entities. And uh, particularly among the scientific staff, there isn't as much representation of people from um, um, underrepresented groups as at, in other job classifications. So it does get to be taxing at times or you end up with groups that are not as uh, diverse as you might ideally like to see. Um, and you know the challenge as we move forward is exactly as Dr. Ford has said, it's important to have that representation. Uh, and yet it's also important to allow people to develop their careers um, and having uh, within NIH some sort of system um, that allows acknowledgement of that commitment and that service is 
uh, an important thing, for instance, when someone's moving up for tenure in our intramural research program. And I think we're beginning to learn how to make that happen. Um, and I think that that's something that happens, that needs to happen extramurally as well. Thank you. I, I want to get Cheryl's take on this same issue because I, I can imagine in the consulting world, there's a similar, you know, many of our institutions rely on consulting services to help us handle the load of research development and get the perspective of um, professionals to determine whether or not grants are ready for prime time. I wonder if you experienced something similar in the consulting world, Cheryl. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know um, that I've experienced that, but I will say when we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the importance of diversity, I think part of it also is that the importance of diversity, when you look at how do you define even some of the, the considerations in terms of the, the criteria that you're looking at. I know in our discussion group, for example, when we talk about the environment um, criteria, I know one of the things that one of our uh, um, members had mentioned, I think it was Dr. Nish had mentioned, what happens if we look at expanding even the, the way we define the criteria? And so when you look at environment, it's not just about resources, but it is about the things like who, you know, what are the, what is, what are the other things that contribute to the success of a researcher as, and support a researcher as they're working on the issues that they're looking at? It's got to be more than just the, the state of the art, you know, research environment, but what is the culture of the institution that's going to support um, someone who's looking at diverse issues and, and issues of, of, um, racial and, and ethnic health disparities. There's more that supports the individual researcher than just the, the, um, the financial resources or the, 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 the um, physical aspects of the lab, but just the culture of the environment that, that supports the researcher. I, I really appreciate that insight. Um, I, I hate to be the one to inform us all that our time has flown by. I hope I speak for everyone to say, I think um, we could have had another hour and a half of conversation, not even come close to unpacking all of the issues. I'm indebted to all of the panelists for taking time to share this important new initiative at NIH and also perspectives on how this can be brought and pulled through the scientific workforce and the work that we all do together. I hope this will be a way for, an, uh, for the FDP to begin thinking about this issue and what we as an organization can be doing to continue to organize around some of the things we do best, which is um, convening and, and, and then thinking about what we can demonstrate um, that might make a difference um, in the lives of so many. So with that, thank you all so much for participating as panelists and also for the audience for staying with us through this really important um, discussion. Um, I hope you will all join us for the federal updates, which are coming up shortly, and um, please do uh, connect with us throughout the week.